a lot of people have heard about you and have sort of seen certain things and whatever. But, you know, with most people who have had an interesting life, that's always just the, that's kind of just the, the tip of the iceberg. So it'd be interesting to sort of find out a little bit more about your background and how you even got into these different areas, right? How you started, you know, like what, what's the story? What's the story behind all that? Right. That's what's interesting when you're a, a public figure, public, whatever you want to call it, people will get a glimmer of the kaleidoscope mm-hmm. and then that's how they define you. And I've, I've seen it even done to you now because oh, I've yeah. seen this stuff for years. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, that's not even, that's not even true. Right. Yeah. So there's, there, there's always two reactions I have to people. One is, well, you know, I might not think that that's fair that you would think that, but I can see why you think that. Mm. And then other times, it's just it's not even true. I don't even I don't even know where your people are getting this from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you have to you have to really become used to it. But I got into so I started off. I was a lawyer. Went to law school. Moved out to California from a small town. Went to law school. Was doing lawyer stuff. But um, all my life, early on, I'd, I'd done like martial arts and read philosophy, and was really just trying to kind of figure out life. You know, maybe, maybe I was a, a sad kid in hindsight, you know, it's hard, hard to know for sure. Well, no, I mean, I certainly was as a little kid, a little, little sad kid probably. And I was just always trying to figure out life just for myself. And then I remember when I was taking a road trip or when I was 19 or so, 18, 19, 20, and I found this book, Dale Carnegie. It wasn't how to friend wins, uh, how to win friends and influence people, which is great, mm-hmm. but it's how to stop worrying and start living. Okay. And it's actually the better of the two books. And I thought, man, you know, one day I want to kind of write a legacy book like this, a kind of book you're dead for a hundred years. Some teenager is in a bookstore somewhere and they find your book. Mm-hmm. And that was always in the back of my mind that I wanted to do it. I just wasn't really sure how I would do it, what I would write about. And I, but that was always in the back of my mind. So, so then I was in law school, was doing legal blogging, mm-hmm. And I was an early, early adopter of like blogging as a platform to, because I never wanted to be a writer. This is what's weird about these paths that, that people take is I never wanted to be a writer per se, but I always wanted to, to people to read me, which is, sounds like a contradiction, but here yeah. we are. And I started law blogging and then I, I transferred over to more lifestyle kind of blogging, more mindset kind of blogging, picked up a huge audience mm. for that kind of I was recognized in public for the first time from a blog which is sort of was kind of a weird thing weird thing right yeah what was um what were the, what were those first blogs so I know you had, yeah, I had a, a early blog crime and federalism okay yeah that was just my early law blog a lot mm. of people don't know about that because I have a whole law life before my mindset life before my whatever social political commentary life yeah. and yeah, so people started recognizing me in public from a blog and it was kind of weird. And then some of the articles were just like killing it on page views. So I reverse engineered how I'd write my book. I, I would see, oh, this, this article or whatever got 150,000 uniques or something and mm-hmm. 300,000 uniques. I'm like, wow, that's, this is a lot. At least yeah. it felt like a lot and I think it was a lot. Mm-hmm. And then, so then I started shaping my, my book around stuff that I had written. And then that gave way to Guerrilla Mindset, which I published in 2015 in Thailand. Okay. So I lived, yeah, yeah, I lived, I lived in, so that, that's just a kind of a, that's a shorter story, the longer story. Mm-hmm. But the, the meta story is that how your life vision becomes realized. I just always had this life vision that, you know what, one day I'm going to live in Paris and write in Paris. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how. I was going to do that, I just, but I knew it in my heart that I was going to do that. And then, you know, I did that. Yeah. And one day I'm going to write a book that like a lot of people read and, you know, I've done that. Mm-hmm. And I never had, you know, way more people read me now, but I never, never could have even imagined yeah. now, but just, just it's incomprehensible in those days. So when you were, when you were writing the blog, what was the, what was the real motivation for that? Especially as someone who said you, you don't, you know, didn't, and maybe still don't particularly love the art of writing. What was it that made you sort of keep going with that? Because I think blog blogs are pretty difficult to be consistent with. Like if you don't really, really just sort of like love the, uh, 
I don't know, love, love the art of it itself. So what sort of kept you motivated in terms of just putting down those words and then just leaving them up on the internet for anyone to read? Right. I just, I would always just blow off steam. I've, okay. I've said it before that you shouldn't, whenever people go, Oh, I want to, I want to start a podcast. I want to start a blog. And I go, well, can you not write? Mm. What do you mean? Can, or, do you feel like if you don't say something that you're going to throw up and feel yeah. sick? Yeah. I don't feel like do it because you won't make any money. If you do make money, it'll be a long time mm -hmm. away. You'll be in obscurity. Nobody's going to read your stuff. Just the nature of the world. But if you feel like it, so for me, I was just blowing off steam. I was yeah, just yeah. goofing off, saying things, you know, and, and this, just to show that I had no idea I'd be here, I was just saying anything because no, I'm like, <laughs> you know, you're just like, yeah. you know, firing stuff off because that was the point. It was just like a, a goof, a goof off kind of deal. Mm -hmm. And then, and then as, as you, as you do that, you find your own voice. Mm -hmm. You know, the number one challenge that people have as an artist is how do you find your voice? Well, you have to scream a lot. Yeah. You don't just get up there. I mean, some people maybe do like Kanye or someone, right? But <laughs> I'm not Kanye. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I'm the Kanye of, social, of Twitter now, but it took me 20 years, 20 years to do that. Yeah. But I think about it, Notorious B.I.G., like he and Tupac, they died in their like early 20s. Yeah, mid-20s. Right? And you're thinking, wait, so Tupac was doing that at 19? That's crazy. Yeah. So some people have that. Other people, you just got to grind for it. Mm. And I was definitely the latter category of person who I just, I just had to grind. Awesome. And you, you've gone through, I mean, with your, your blogs and your work, I mean, you've really gone through a big range of different things. So you started out in law and then you moved on more to kind of uh, masculinity and lifestyle kind of stuff. And then more into mindset and self-improvement and then into the world of, you know, politics and commentary and journalism what's the what was the thread between all those different things the thread really is just crushing it smashing it whatever you're going to do just crush it mm. when i when i waited tables for tips for, for college like i just crushed it i was like i'm just going to be a great waiter i'm just going to get the most tips even though women always get tipped more than men and that's just the way it is yeah. but every time like even if it was some like crappy job i was always like just gotta crush it so the common thread was always just, just really bring it in whatever you do and then level up, level up at what you're doing, level up the leverage of what you're doing, level up the game of what you're doing. So that, that was the common thread. So that's why for me, it was nothing to go from, you know, I want to go to law school and I want to be like a legal scholar mm -hmm. and I want to like write articles that are influential. And I did. And then I want to write a website about gym stuff, mindset, lifestyle, just that nobody was, the stuff that I, that people take for granted, like me, I was talking about, you know, androgenics and a lot of other things that, you know, kids shouldn't get into, mm -hmm. you know, something when you're much older, maybe you think about, nobody would talk openly about it. I would just sure. say, look, here's, you know, here's what I'm doing. Yeah. And I was so full, fully transparent, any, any part of my life, that sort of authenticity, especially from uh, male writers, usually the, uh, the authentic style was reserved. There were a lot of like female writers were kind of allowed to do that, but men weren't really allowed to do that. Just really authentic, vulnerable writing. Yeah. And I, I did that because if you want to be a writer, then, and you want to be, be a beautiful writer, you want to create anything beautiful and meaningful. You have to hurt. You have mm -hmm. to suffer. People mm -hmm. don't realize that you have to share, share a piece of your soul every time you write. And that was a common theme. And because of that, like when I wrote about the kind of stuff I wrote about, there was no one else like doing it. Yeah. When I, when I moved into Twitter or social media or whatever, mm -hmm. people just like, they'd never seen anything like that before. Put some respect on my name. Sick like a 